Hi, this is Bob Kuhn from Binary Hammer, and in this video I will talk about how algorithms can implement game mechanics and how those algorithms can be used in other applications. I'll walk you through the code and show you how it works, and I've provided links to any algorithm that I mentioned so you can read more about them. Okay, my game here is a simple 2D turn-based strategy game where I have two armies, orange and blue, and the object of the game is for an army to connect both sides of its base together, and it does that by traversing the map. The blue army traverses horizontally, so it needs to connect left to right, and the orange army connects top to bottom, so it moves vertically. You can see here that the game is highlighting the next valid move for the player, and blue's going first. Uh, and you can see that it's blue's turn, not just by the highlighting, but also the glow of the sides of the bases. You can see that the blue is bright and dark is orange, and that changes as the game plays. So navigating is just a, a simple uh, act of tapping on the location that you want to traverse to. And if it's empty, the army automatically occupies it. But if the other army is already there, then there's going to be a conflict. So let me just progress a little bit here. And here you can see that this is a valid move for orange because the orange army doesn't occupy it. So I can start a conflict by tapping on it. And in my game here, just to make it simple, the aggressor always wins. But in a real game, I would have a complicated calculation to determine who wins. Maybe the army has to spread out its troops along all of the occupied territories so it can better defend it. Maybe they can erect a building to help defend it. Maybe the army has advanced weaponry to help uh, more guarantee that it would be victorious in a conflict. Those kinds of things all come into play when determining who wins. But for now, it's always the aggressor. And you can see that orange has split blues territory into two groups, left and right here. And the highlighting, uh, it doesn't make any difference to the highlighting. It knows all of the, the territories that Blue owns uh, and knows how to highlight appropriately. And we'll talk about how it's able to do that. So let me just uh, progress a little bit further here. And you can see that the Blue selected the rightmost location, but that doesn't make a connection because there's obviously no connection, no constant connection to the left. Uh, so that wasn't a win situation. So now I'm just going to finish off the game and win for blue. And you heard that the blue army just won because there's a connection from left to right. Okay, so let me describe now how I did that. But first, I need to describe the problems that need to be solved here. First is the highlighting of any applicable move. The other is knowing if there's a continuous connection from one side to the other. And there's a separate, smaller sub-problem of having, have, having to do that efficiently. And we'll cover all three in this video. I first started uh, by thinking that percolation using union find uh, would work here. And what percolation does is answer the question of, is one side connected to the other? Uh, and percolation is really good for static data, data that doesn't change. Uh, and uh, a specific version of union find can't is the fastest possible way to do that. And it's almost O of one, so it's almost instant. Uh, the weighted quick union with path compression is able to do that. But uh, so union find is great for finding connections in static data, but it's not suitable for this game because I need to resolve those conflicts and have the connections change as the game plays out. So deleting with union find uh, is neither simple nor efficient. So that's not a good solution. So I thought to describe the problem as a graph. Uh, uh, specifically undirected graph. And all a graph is, is a set of vertices 
and a collection of edges that each connect a pair of vertices. So pairs of vertices are connected by edges and it's just a collection of those. That's all it is. Um, so how might you represent that in a data structure? Well, you could use a linked list of edges. Uh, a vertice has a list of edges, which are connections to other verts, vertex vertices. Uh, so vertex two, for example, could have any number of connections to it. So that would be represented in two's link list. Vertex 20 might have a separate set of connections. So the list, if you will, of connections goes from two to 20. Uh, you can also represent connections with a 2D matrix of Booleans, let's say, uh, where each row column entry uh, is set to true whenever there is a connection. Uh, but neither of those are good solutions because they don't scale. And imagine if I can zoom way out and see thousands of locations all at once. Neither of those are good because they don't scale well. Uh, a linked list, for example, will take too long to, to traverse because you won't know if a vertex has connections unless you walk the list of those connections. Uh, I said it goes from 2 to 20, but what about 6 through 19? You won't know those don't have connections unless you walk through the entire list. Uh, so that's no good. It's too slow. 2D matrix, if I have thousands or even millions of locations, that's thousands or millions squared. So that will just consume too much memory. So that's not a good solution. What I did was use a, what's called adjacency lists. And what that is, is I have an array of vertices that each contains a pointer to its connections. So you can see here, I call it adjacent verts in the code that I'm going to show you. And there's zero to numverts minus one of them. And that's how they're identified, zero through numverts minus one. So I have numverts of those in an array. And each one of those is points to a collection. And that could be linked list, set, bag, any kind of data structure like that. I chose set because that's uh, more efficient to delete connections. Uh, and that's important for me when uh, a location uh, is in conflict and the other army needs to take it over. If it's already owned by one, it needs to be owned by another. Uh, sets al allow that to happen efficiently. You could also do it with linked list. It's up to you to determine which collection you want to use. Uh, so in this example, vertex zero is pointing is connected to 17, 5, and 14. Vertex 1 isn't connected to anything, so it has an empty container. 2 connects to 11 and 5. And 3 and 4 is an interesting example, and it shows the how the adjacency list is set up. Uh, to, to establish a connection, you add 1 in the adjacency list of the other. So it's two steps. Uh, so to connect three and four, you add four to three's list and three to four's list. And that's important because you don't know which order they're going to be traversed in, walked through in, in the code. So you need to make sure that if three is navigated to first, you need to know that it's connected to four. Likewise, if four is looked at first, you need to know that it's connected to three and so on. Uh, so you can also see in five here points to is, is connected to two zero two twelve and thirty two. So if you look at zero's list, you can see five here, and two you can also see five. And that's really all adjacency lists are. It's that simple. Um, the point here is that there's an an entry for every vertice, and there's also an empty container attached to every vertice, so there's no holes, and that's for efficiency purposes. Okay, now let me show you some code. Here I have a structure called vert that for my game needs a team and a connected component ID, and we'll get to that shortly. 
and I have an array of these verts uh, that's set to numvert some arbitrary number that makes sense to my game. And I also have another array of sets, one for, for each vert. And the sets contain uh, indices to connected verts. Uh, so those are indices into the verts array, whatever vert is connected to some other vert. I also have here uh, a visited array of booleans, again, one for each vert. And we'll, that is important for the traversal of the verts and knowing how to highlight and how to establish a connected com component. We'll get to that shortly too. Uh, I'm going to skip this part here and go down to the bottom that shows the how the adjacency list is set up. And to make a connection, uh, all the code here, by the way, is all pseudocode. So it's not any specific language, but kind of an amalgamation of languages. I try to make it as generic as possible so you can derive what needs to be done in whatever language you support. So, for example, here, to make a connection, to connect A to B, I add B to A's adjacent verts list and A to B's adjacent vert list. And to disconnect A from B, it's just the reciprocal. Remove B from A's list and A from B's list. It's really that simple. And to know if two verts are connected, you simply ask A's verts, does it contain B? If it is true, then they're connected. And it's literally that simple. Tiny amount of code to establish connections and uh, disconnections. Okay, this code here uh, are support routines. And the first one, init verts. Uh, for my game, all that does is set each vertex team ID to no team. So they're all empty, pretty much. Uh, and this doesn't have to be a loop. If on your CPU, it makes more sense to, because it's a separate array, you can use memset or memclear or some other kind of really fast and efficient memory clearing method instead of a loop. Use that. Uh, your mileage may vary, but just to express it here, I've shown it as a loop. So you might want to do other things in this init. All I need to do right now is just set the team to no team. And also mark all verts as unvisited. You will see that a couple of times in the other code that I'm going to show you. And that's a similar thing here where all you're doing is setting the visited array to false because you haven't visited yet. You're about to set up a visited process. So you're going to clear all of those to false. And again, because it's separate, there might be a faster way on your CPU to do that. But again, I'm just showing that as a loop. Okay, now, uh, before I get into the code, I need to show you the underlying structure of the data. And I have here, I'm representing the graph as a 2D grid. Uh, that makes sense for my game. Uh, other games could be hexagons or circles. It really doesn't matter for the data uh, because the connections to vertices is what's important, not the graphical representation. So. You can take that to mean the same data can be represented many different ways. Uh, I just chose it to be a 2D grid. Uh, the connections, as I play the game, uh, I mentioned that uh, it's based on the who owns the current location uh, to know what can be highlighted and what can't be highlighted. Um, that's just a north, south, east, west adjacency test. Uh, if I wanted to, I could also add diagonals uh, and I would just add more checks to to determine that. But to keep my code simple so that you could understand the process, I left it to north, south, east, or west. And again, that's totally arbitrary. Uh, if you wanted octagons, you can have eight uh, connections. Uh, it's really up to your game. And the, the code that I'm going to show you supports all of that. Uh, so to facilitate the opening move, uh, you remember that, uh, I could show you here, 
that these two are marked as highlighted, even though I don't, the, the blue army doesn't own any locations yet. So how am I able to sh highlight those two specifically? I'm able to do that because I have an extra ring of vertices here. And what I do is mark an arbitrary number of them as available to be connected to. Uh, and that's really just for the opening move. Uh, I mark the the code knows that, oh, these two are owned by blue. It's blue's turn. So I'll highlight whatever is adjacent to that and visible. So this extra ring is not visible to the player. It's only the internal grid, what's in white here. And it's six by six. Again, that's arbitrary. Um, I'm also able to, oh, uh, to determine if the left connects to the right. Uh, normally, uh, the first thought, that the, the slower way to do it is to have this vertex check this vertex. Is there a connection? No. All right, check this vertex against that vertex. Is there a connection? No. Then check that one, that one, that one. So that's n by n checks. So in this case, it's six by six checks to determine if it's connected. As the game plays out, I'm maintaining all of the connections to the locations. So it always knows what's connected to what. Uh, so that part is easy, but n squared checks is really inefficient. So a really cool way to make that all turn into just one check is I have an extra four vertices that is also hidden. And all I do is connect the outer ring to them. So that in order to check left-right connections, all I have to do is make one call to see if this vertex connects to that vertex, east to west, in one check. Um, because the everything is connected, it just knows that this is connected to that one or not. So that's a really cool uh, efficiency optimization step that I included here. And so let me show you this, which is what I call the debug mode, uh, the debug view. And there's a few things going on that this shows you. Uh, the first is all the connections and the current occupier and owner of the vertices. And you can see here that these two are highlighted because these two are currently occupied by the blue team. And you can't see that because it's hidden from the player. But internally, it says, oh, these two are owned by, sorry, occupied by the blue team. I'm going to highlight the adjacent uh, locations next to it. And as I play it out, you can see the connections being made. Now there's a special case along the edges, de depending on who the player is. So the blue, what's important is the left column and right column. Whenever there's a location won by the blue army in either of those columns, it needs to connect to this hidden column of vertices to maintain that connection to this extreme extra vertices. And also, uh, let, let, pay attention to these occupied squares here, locations, after I show the orange move. You see that they disappeared. And I had to do that because if I didn't, this, they would still be highlighted. Uh, so I need to turn that off and just go with, now that blue has legitimately owned a location, I can just use that to determine whatever the highlighted squares need to be. And you can see that is removed here from orange. So I'm just going to make some more connections so you can see those. Uh, so the the code for the orange up here, uh, I took over that territory and it always wants to highlight to connect to to link the the four vertices around it so north south east west uh, and that's what creates this connection here 
and the extra rule that I told you about where if it's the orange winning locations across the top or bottom, it needs to make the connection to this hidden row. Uh, it also does that as well. Just establishing more connections here so you can see those. And you can see that the shape of the highlighted locations uh, is based on the locations that are currently occupied by whatever team is applicable. Uh, these numbers here represent the connected components. And uh, we're going to talk about that next. You can see that there's four of them, zero, one, two, three. And those are arranged in such a way because it, it's based on whatever vertice is traversed to first. So this is, it, it's left, right, top to bottom. So this is the first one that sees if it's a connecting component. So that gets ID zero. The next one that isn't zero that is reached is this one here and that's owned, that's owned by blue. Uh, so that gets its own unique ID of one and it goes through all of the connections for this vert and sets those to one. Scans through here, this is already visited and then it reaches this one which is a new connected component. So it sets that ID to two and so on until it reaches this one which is three. And I'll show you that now. This code here uh, is based off of the, the algorithm that drives pretty much everything is called depth first search. And that's a recursive algorithm uh, that can be used, for example, to solve mazes. So traverse mazes to see if you can get from uh, the start to the end. Uh, and it's, it's not only see if you can get to point A to point B, but what the path from A to B is. I don't need that here for this game, but the algorithm can be used for that. There is also uh, what's called breadth first search, and you can use that on the same exact data, um, but that isn't recursive and it solves different problems. For example, what is the fewest number of connections needed to get from point A to point B? So for games that could be suitable for pathfinding. Again, I don't need that here, um, but if, if you wanted to have uh, specific units, maybe if you zoom in and you can only control uh, a specific unit, a tank or uh, infantry or you know whatever you have, you can use that to see if they can get to a destination and what the fewest points is to get there and what the locations are for that. Uh, so here's the code needed to drive how to set up the connected components. And a connected component, all that is, is what I showed you here, is that the entire group of connected vertices to another vertice. So for example, connected component one, what is connected to one? And it goes through the adjacency list to determine that. So it sets that goes connected to this one. And what is this one connected to? That, that. What is this connected to? That. What is that connected to? That. And so on, which is an exhaustive search to make sure that it sh traverses everything that is connected via that adjacency list. So it does that with two methods, a driver method and a sort of engine method. And the engine is what is the recursive part. So the driver here, which it starts by setting all the verts as unvisited, and that's the code that I already showed you in the, the support method, that just sets everything to false. I haven't visited it yet, and that's important. Uh, I'm, I set the ID to zero, because that's it always starts at zero, and for all of the verts that I haven't visited yet, that is not empty, so I don't care about empty ones then go into the exhaustive search. And I pass in the ID of the vertex that I'm at and the ID I want it to be set to. So that I jump down, down, I jump down here. Uh, and this is the, rec the recursion. For any 
vertex that it enters. It needs to set it to be to visited and also sets the connected component ID to whatever is passed in. And then what it does is look at everything that is connected to it. So it goes through its entire adjacent list. In this case, it sets it to B and checks if B's, if B has been visited. If it hasn't, then it traverses into it by calling itself with B as the source and the CC identity uh, that was whatever's passed in. So that comes in here again and sets what is now B vertex to visited and its ID. And it looks at now what is connected to B, creates a new B, see if it's visited and so on. So that's where the exhaustive list uh, traversal comes in. And what stops it from going forever is, has it been visited yet? Once all of those are true, that is connected, it has no more work to do, so it just unrolls itself from the recursion and comes back to here. Now I've set all of those to ID zero, so I can create that in the roots array, and the root array is really just the first vertex, the index of the first vertex that starts the connected component, so I call that the root and I increment the ID for the next time around. And I can do that here because I can guarantee that when it reaches here, there are no other vertices that are in the connected component that I just traversed because the data is set up to guarantee that. Uh, once you have the connected component IDs set for all of the vertexes, the is connected to check now changes to all you have to do is check the CC ident. So if they match, they are connected. So in this case, these two aren't connected yet because their idents don't match. But as soon as I have enough locations the very last one to make a connection, the connected component IDs are redetermined and it sees that this would now be connected to that. So it would have the same connected component ID. So what I'm doing there is m turning the check into an instant determination instead of anything else that requires time and effort. I've, it's just a simple lookup. So that's O of one, that's instant time. Now the highlighting is the next problem that needs to be solved. And that's also done by depth first search. Uh, it's slightly different because it has different work to do, but the structure of it is identical as what I just showed you. There is a driver routine and a recursive engine routine. And there's also, because it's different work, I have different data to maintain. So here it's uh, an array of Booleans to see if it has been highlighted yet or not. So it's similar to the visited array, different but similar. Uh, and also a, a set of connections. So that's in a separate array, one for each vertex. And that's important when conflicts are resolved. So if the team that owns a vertex needs to change from blue to orange, for example, it has to remove it from blue and connect it to orange. But in, to know what the orange vertex is, it's stored in this connector. And I'll, I'll show you that here. So the driver also has to clear its unvisited, uh, and also it needs to clear the highlighted. So it marks all verts as unhighlighted, which really just clears this array, similar to the uh, clearing the visited array. And what's slightly different here is that 
it only needs to check all of the connected components. So this would be called after the connected components are determined. Uh, and that's another optimization where the list of connected components is very tiny. So th this traversal is very quick. And again, it checks the visited data. F that was this vertex visited? Uh, sorry, I didn't tell you what uh, index was, but that's A in the, the previous example. Uh, so it's really just an index into the vertex list. Uh, and also you're comparing its team. So if the team matches, then I'm in, it, it's uh, a candidate for highlighting. So it traverses, it goes into the recursive routine for that vertex and marks it as visited. Again, that's very important. And also just arbitrarily, well, not arbitrarily, just always tries to mark the four adjacent vertices around it, north, south, east, and west. Uh, and I determine what the, because my data is represented as a 2D array, I just turn the index into X and Y coordinates uh, because it's e easier to check what's north and south, east and west based on that location. So if you jump down here, uh, highlight vertex at X and Y for team and with a connector. So the connector is what this routine was entered with. So the vertex that I'm talking about that is adjacent to it. So what's important here is that is X or Y off the map? If it is, if either one is, then there's no work to do because that would make a, uh, a bad data connection. Then I turn the X and Y coordinate back into an index so I can traverse the, so I can look into the highlighted array. And if it's already highlighted, I don't have to do anything. I can exit out. And likewise, if the team is already set to the team I'm trying to connect to, that's a redundant check. I don't have to do that. So I just exit out. So after all of those checks, uh, it's now applicable to highlight it. So I set it to true for that index. And also I set the connector for that index to the connection vertex that it came in as. So in this case, it's A. Once it does all of that, it does an exhaustive depth first search list, just like the previous code and checks, goes through all of the connected vertices in A, calls it B, asks is B, has B been visited yet? And is the team applicable? If it is, then it go, uses that as the source and calls itself recursively. And just like the previous code, it will set every applicable vertex as highlightable for the next move because you're going through all of the connected components and only doing it for the team that it applies to, you're guaranteed to get all of team A's connections, connected components. That's why the code doesn't care if blue team, for example, has 20 connected components. It'll find them all because they're all in the uh, CC roots array. Great. One last thing is conflict resolution that I call linking and unlinking. So if blue owns a vertex, a location, and it needs to change to orange because orange was the aggressor and won that off of blue, I need to unlink that from blue and link it to orange. So I'll show you unlink first. Uh, and I just call unlink with a vertex ID, which is just an index into the array, spin through its 
adjacent verts list and remove that remove a from the connected adjacent verts so it goes through a's connections calls it b and removes a from b and then when that's done it clears all of a's connections because it's about to establish new connections for it and also it sets the team to no team and i, I don't really have to do that i just think it's think it's uh it keeps the data in sync because there's no connections now how can it possibly have a team if there's no connections so i just clear it there it's about to be set to to uh, a team anyway so when it comes in, it has an index called A. I convert that into a 2D coordinate for my, for my data. So it asks, what is the team at X and Y for the north, south, east, and west? So for all of the adjacent locations about which I'm about to link, it says, is the team that is there equal to the team that I want to change it to, that I want to link it to? If it is, then I connect it to the north vert and then set the team to whatever it wants to be. And then likewise, check south, link it to that if it's applicable. Check east, set, link that. Check west, link that. So... Up to four connections can be made whenever a vertex needs to change. But what's really cool is that you're guaranteed that all of the previous connections that it had are all cleared out so that there's no straggling data or anything like that. Uh, and that's it. Those are the four, the, the three problems that I needed to solve. Uh, we talked about depth first search uh, and how to do that. I showed you the code uh, on how to do that. And the performance of depth for search and the uh, the uh, adjacent C list uh, is really good for space. Uh, it's the number of edges plus the number of verts. Uh, the time to create a connection is the log of the number of verts. To check if two verts are connected, that's also the log of number of verts, but one, it's instant if you use connected components. So that's both of those are very quick. One is obviously instant. Uh, to, and to iterate through the, the verts adjacent to another vert, it's the log of the number of verts plus the degree of that vert. And the degree just means how many connections it has. So it boils down to this is a really quick algorithm and it scales really well. You can use this algorithm for all kinds of games, uh, specifically tile matching games, so match three, uh, a collection of objects where you can tap on one and all of the connective, connected objects disappear and new ones fall to take it their place. Uh, it's, it's really useful for that too. Uh, I've seen games where you can shoot a colored bubble up to a cloud of other colored bubbles and the connection that it makes there uh, pops those bubbles and maybe causes other unconnected bubbles to fall off if there's no other connections there. Uh, and there's also lots of other non-gaming applications, like, for example, genetics, um, molecules, you know, the atoms and the bonds between them, uh, circuits, yeah, even social networks. Is this friend connected to, uh, is this person connected to that person via however many friends in between? Um, and also neural networks. Um, so uh, I hope this video helped. Uh, you have access to the code and links to the algorithms that I discussed. Uh, and that's it. Now go out there and do great things. And thanks for watching.